documentary being made called Plastic Love. Plastic From Plastic Love to Zero Waste is the full title, right? Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having us. The name of our event last night was From Plastic Love to Zero Waste because we were working with some really amazing uh, zero waste activists. The name of our film itself is Plastic Love. Okay, awesome. Uh, when I was researching for this talk, a really funny thing happened, which I'm sure happens to a lot of people researching your film. Uh, there is a 1980s Japanese band called Plastic Love, which comes up first. So just uh, to make sure if you are searching for information about this film, make sure you write Plastic Love Film or Plastic Love Documentary and we will put up the website as well. Uh, you're not connected to that 80s band, I assume, right? Well, no, we're not, but um, there is a very famous song out there called Plastic Love by Maria Takeuchi, I think is her name. And that is actually not a coincidence because okay. we are sort of playing a little bit with that, you know, 80s sort of bubble era vibe of you know, mass consumption, mass production, sort of becoming very popular around the world. And that's where that music comes from. And that's where the plastic love started all around the world, including Japan. So wow. we do, we did get inspiration from that for our well, that's, title. That's great it's that it's coincidence. connected, you know, and you can draw on some of the ideas from the song. Because plastic, it's a problem that's been happening probably since the 80s, you know, but we're only now addressing it. Uh, would you guys mind yeah. introducing yourselves as we start? Go ahead, Sibylla, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. Thank you for having us, Joy. Like, we're so excited to be on the show um, first day after our um, trailer launch and crowdfunding launch. So my name is Sibylla Patrizia, and I'm an Austrian documentary filmmaker and photographer. I've lived in Japan for maybe five years now, which is my home of choice and um, I'm working on this new documentary film called Plastic Love as the director um, which we've been working on since 2019 Clementine and I and uh, I'm gonna give it to Clem our amazing producer to introduce herself. Thank you Sydney. Hi Joya. Thank you so much for having us today. We're so excited to be out in the world finally talking about the film after so long working on it. So my name is Clementine Nuttall. I'm a British artist and filmmaker I also came to Japan five years ago. Sibi and I came over around the same time to really study our specialisms at Tokyo University of the Arts. And that's where we came together to work together first. Oh, so interesting. And this project, Plastic Love, um, last night I attended your wonderful event, which I just mentioned, uh, Plastic Love to Zero Waste. And there were so many great talks and so many great insights from the movie, as well as showing the premiere of your preview, which is very exciting. And I would love to show the preview as well to our audience right now. Is that okay? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. All right, let's see if this works. So everybody, please enjoy. Uh, before we start, did you want to introduce what people are going to see or just leave it to them? Of course, let me just say a couple words. So um, our film is called Plastic Love, Unwrapping Japan's Toxic Affair with Plastic. It's going to be a 90 minute feature length documentary film that's coming out in 2022. And um, now we're just super excited to have our trailer out for the first time to give people a preview into what we're doing. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Wonderful. And this was only released last night, right? Yes, last night was the world premiere. So you're one of the first people to be showing this. Fantastic.
is awesome. It's so good. You guys should be really, really proud of that. That is just such a great preview. And I know that this kind of stuff, it doesn't happen lightly. It doesn't happen easily. Uh, what you guys have done even so far is really impressive. How does it feel to Thank see you it so much. happening? <laughs> uh, so good. Oh, no. Oh, no. Wait, <laughs> I mean, wait. as I, as I, sorry, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, okay. It, yeah. It was <laughs> yeah, it still running amazing. in the background. Um, sorry. Oh, no problem. Um, I mean, as I said before, Clementine and I have worked on this since 2019 way before Corona started and we've been to so many places and met so many people. So, you know, to show the world what we're working on and what the film is going to be like, is just amazing. Right, Clem? Yeah, it really is. And it's just lovely this period right now where we're getting to share it with people who are also really passionate about the issue. Just, I think is probably going to be the high point of the whole experience. You know, we spent the last couple of years just, trying so hard to make the film, reaching out to so many people, of course, some of them who wanted to talk to us, but some of them who really didn't. And next year, we'll be trying to get the film out to people who perhaps are not so receptive to the issue. But right now we're talking to people who are really already plastic conscious, who already really care about the issues and who are excited to see the trailer. And it's just, it's awesome to connect with those people right now. Yeah. And I love to see that you, of course, are featuring Kamikatsu, a very important uh, place. You have key uh, information, key speaker from Akira Sakano, who was based in Kamikatsu for a long time, now doing Zero Waste Japan in Kyoto and other areas. Um, have you been to Kamikatsu to do your research? Yes, so we already filmed our whole Kamikatsu section last October or November, I think. It was amazing. I mean, we just loved our time there. We spent about three or four days there. We met different people um, who were involved in the whole zero waste activism that's happening there. I think probably a lot of your listeners already know, but um, Kamikatsu was the first town in Japan that declared itself being a zero waste town. And they have this amazing really ambitious goal to turn their um, town into a fully zero waste community. And they're doing so many things. Everyone is working so hard. And despite being such a small town, they've had an amazing impact on all of Japan and around the world. They've become very famous. Lots of people know about Kamikatsu now. And and um, it's just really has been an eye opener how, you know, really at the core of this whole issue, what we need to be talking about is zero waste and how we can change our society and our behavior to become more um you know of a zero waste sort of society yeah absolutely and i i visited kamikatsu many times in fact i'm going back this month for a research and Aww. tourism development uh program yeah so it's it's just so inspiring to be there and i know that other areas of japan they get really frustrated thinking Oh, we can never do it like Kamikatsu, but they've been doing it since 2003. So they have really started a long time ago and they have developed a, a really important infrastructure. They had Akira Sakino really active talking about it at Davos and around the world on TED Talks. So I think she really lent a voice to Kamikatsu and what they were trying to do and really put it on the map for Japan which I think is what you're doing with your film, you are also helping, and it, it may not seem like it, but you are also helping brand Japan in a sustainable way. Because you're talking about these issues, but you're also talking about solutions. I think you are doing a service for Japan as a brand, a place where we have innovators and people seeking solutions and looking for answers. This is a worldwide problem. This is not only in Japan, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, Clem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like you say, Kamikatsu is just an amazing place, not only because they've got this huge goal of zero waste, but also because it really demonstrates the amazing knock-on effects of a goal like that. You know, you see that they're not only aiming for zero waste, they're also rejuvenating the community, 
it's a place for uh, older members of the community to meet. People, you know, go and have parties at their Gomi Center, which is just incredible. And it's beautiful there. We love spending time there. We could definitely see wanting to go on holiday to Hotel Y, which is a hotel at a trash center, which is amazing. And of course, you know, talking about Akira Sakano, who's doing such incredible work, and she's a huge voice for us in the film. We've interviewed her and seen her at work doing what they're doing with Zero Waste Japan now and all of the reach out that they're doing. You know, we just have a huge amount of respect for what she's doing and how she's communicating it. And um, yeah, we're just, like you said, you know, Japan, of course, we have issues here, but we, you know, Sibi and I just both really love Japan and we really are looking for the solutions and we're incredibly inspired by the, the, the things that we see here and we do exactly want to shine a light on it. Wonderful. And you just launched your Kickstarter campaign as well. And like your website, like your movie, uh, I think we mentioned before we started today, everything is very bilingual. You have a great team working hard on the English and the Japanese. You saw during the preview that you have Japanese, but you also have English subtitles. If you have English, you'll probably have Japanese subtitles. So going for uh, awareness in the Japanese market, but also spreading the message to an international global audience, I'm sure it's more work, but so worthwhile. Yeah, but you know, I mean, one of the things that always frustrates me is that there is this really big disconnect, I feel like, between a lot of the foreign community that lives in Japan and the Japanese community. And, you know, I think Clem and I, we see ourselves more of we live in this country and we want to embrace everyone who is here. And we also want to embrace the international community that we're part of. And so like for us from the start, it was basically a no-brainer that we wanted to do everything in both languages so that it's accessible to everyone. It's not a film for non-Japanese only. It's also not a film for Japanese only. Um, but having said that, we don't want to be a production like many other foreign productions who come to Japan, spend some time here, and then just market the film abroad. And it's like, oh, look at Japan. Everything is crazy and different and weird. No, I mean, we are trying to also have an impact in the Japanese community. And I think it's really important and it's a big part of our project that we're connecting all those communities together um, to show people in Japan um, what is happening you know in Japan and how also this has an effect on other countries abroad and then at the same time showing other communities abroad what is happening in Japan and what we can learn from the issues but also from the solutions and I think you know we're such an international community in the world where everyone is connected and that includes Japan so we just um, want to make sure that our production reflects that and connects everybody together. That's fantastic. And like the event you did last night, uh, you're collaborating with Zero Waste Japan, Akira Sakano's group. You're connecting with uh, Mai Mizu, uh, who is one of your big collaborators, which is a, a great uh, collaborator talking about zero waste and doing cleanups and finding places to refill your bottles so you don't have to buy... Uh, plastic. I also noticed on the Kickstarter that you're also collaborating with Echo Hachi, Reusable Wraps, and she has also been in the talk show series last year talking about making the wax reusable wraps. So tell us about your Kickstarter. What are you aiming for? What are some of the rewards people can expect? Clementine, maybe this is a good question for you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we've been so lucky with our collaborators on the Kickstarter. You know, we just reached out to the people that we thought were doing amazing work, which of course, my Mizu, Echo Hachi, No Plastic Japan. Um, and we've had so much support with it. We've been so grateful. And in terms of our Kickstarter, there are some really lovely rewards from those people. So of course, when you, you sign up to the Kickstarter, we've got our 72 hour early bird special, which is for a couple of our prizes, which are uh, to watch the film as when it comes out and also to sit on our uh, preview council, which is where for a few people, we thought we would love to hear some direct feedback. And so one of our rewards is that you can sign up and see the film with its first cut and sit down with Sibylla and I and discuss actually what has worked, what hasn't, you know, really, 
have a chance to influence how the film works out. And then we have a couple of lovely zero waste rewards. So the beautiful Marisa's beautiful Echo Hatchy Beeswax wraps, which I think Sibylla gave me for my birthday last year. We've both been using them a lot as we go out on our shoots, um, our no plastic straws from No Plastic Japan and a lovely My Mizu water bottle as well. And then we've also got things, you know, truly zero waste treats like sponsoring beach cleanups. So if you just really want to see the film be made, um, and you're passionate about the issue, then sponsoring us as we go out and do beach cleanups and plogging uh, is also on our rewards list. And there are then things like the screenshots from the film and uh, some talk events. And then our, our big biggest one is our um, Kintsugi. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that shot. So our Plastic Love Dream Day, where you have both Sibylla and I um, presenting the film and uh, my uh, specialism outside of making the film is kintsugi. So we would be teaching a kintsugi class, which of course ties into the whole reuse, repair um, philosophy. Kintsugi, yeah, is, what, that, what, try, is that oh, sorry. repairing? Sorry, just, just a point uh, for people outside Japan. Kintsugi, is that where you have like a broken pottery vase and you repair it with gold or something? Is that kintsugi? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's this specifically Japanese technique of repairing ceramics with gold. And I saw that on your website. You are both artistic. You have both done films before. So both of you have these fantastic websites with all your previous work as well. So it's good for the listeners to know that you're bringing this wealth of experience and insights in the creative world to this project. And so that's so interesting to see that that's one of the rewards. How wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we thought about what kind of rewards we want to do, I mean, obviously the main reward is that people can watch the film when it comes out. Um, we want to make it available to as many people as possible. But at the same time, we didn't want to create any extra waste because that would, of course, totally go against what we're trying to do. So we found some amazing partners um, who make really great products that are zero waste. And also for people who really don't want to buy anything else, they can, like Clementine said, sponsor a beach cleanup, for example, or, you know, chat with us or actually influence the film. And um, we hope that people find those rewards exciting. And we're super happy to have the um, crowdfunding campaign launched yesterday. It's going to be up for one month and um, it's going to help us finish the film it's going to help us distribute the film and bring a really powerful message out there and um, we are an independent production so you know everything that has been done for this film is pretty much based on the work of many amazing volunteers and um, all we want is just to bring this film out there and for as many as people as possible to see it that's fantastic and you only have a month um, for this Kickstarter. So I'll definitely, I'll put the link below uh, to make sure people can find it and definitely check out that Kickstarter and give you guys some funding and support for this amazing project so you can get it done. So exciting. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your support. Yeah, thank you so much, Joy. It really, and I think even, you know, we know it's a lot to ask and we know that some people aren't in a position to sponsor, but even just sharing the film is a huge thing for us giving us feedback on the trailer is a huge thing for us. I don't know about you, Subi, but last night having those conversations with people after the event was really inspiring for me. You know, getting that direct feedback from the trailer and really sharing it with people was so, so handy. Yeah. Uh, for me, watching it for the first time is so impactful and so horrible and frustrating and so inspiring and wonderful at the same time. You know, and I, I'm sure a lot yeah. of people who are passionate about sustainability in Japan will have a similar reaction. Isn't that wild? And the music is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, we had people tell us already that they've had like tears in their eyes and they've gotten like chills watching the trailer. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is what we're trying to achieve is to get this topic and bring it close to people's hearts, because I think you know, what's happening right now is just there's just a little bit of a disconnect in society where people don't fully understand what's going on. And for us, making a film is a great way in which we hope we can bring this topic closer to people um, in a way that everybody can understand. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be an activist. Um, 
And I think that's really the power of art. And I think that's what we can contribute to this issue. And um, yeah, it's going to be hard to watch in some cases, but hopefully also really inspiring at the same time. Yeah. And you mentioned this a little bit last night, uh, finding access to uh, people to talk to you, finding access to recycling centers. I'm sure that's really difficult. Um, but you do have some great interviews, some great collaborators in terms of sharing information from their industry. Can you talk about that a little bit? Of course. Yeah, so basically the biggest challenge, other than, of course, there being a global pandemic going on that makes it very difficult to film, has been getting access to a lot of the places that we have now filmed at, especially places like incinerators, especially places like plastic producers, which to this day, we still have not been able to find a plastic producer that's willing to talk to us. It's also been incredibly hard to film at recycling companies, which is something that I was really surprised by because you would think that they would be more willing to share their insights. But I think that probably deep down, all of these places know that there is a big issue going on. And, you know, I think they understand that in our film, we, we do try to point out both of the issues and the solutions at the same time. And I think, yeah, I mean, that's been really, really tough getting access. We have contacted you know, over a hundred incinerators, recyclers, producers, and whatnot. We literally just got access to one incinerator. We got access to one recycler, access to no plastic production company. Um, so that's been really hard, but, you know, we try to just not give up and push as hard as we can, being really open about what our goal is. And really at the end of the day, you know, we're not trying to say this company is bad or this company is good we're just trying to show what is happening you know what is the truth of waste management for example in japan what is the truth of how plastic is produced and distributed and then we can all get together and look at it and then learn from that and then see what the next steps are towards the solution because i think you know as long as we don't fully understand what's going to happen there isn't going to be a clear way towards the solution so i think just getting together and realizing this is all of us together. It's not the incinerators necessarily that are bad. It's us as a society who are producing this amount of waste in the first place that needs to be then incinerated. You know, it's us who are making this plastic that should get recycled, but isn't get recycled. So, you know what I mean? I don't feel like there is so much of a fault at these specific places. I think the fault lies with us as a society around the world, not just in Japan. And um, yeah, I think one of the exciting things in our film is that we did, we did get access to a few places like the one you're showing right now, which is a landfill site in Yokohama where you are getting the ash that comes from incinerators. And this ash is then being used um, to make land essentially, where you have trucks coming in every day directly from the incinerators. There is a section that was cordoned off from the ocean. So it's not directly connected to the ocean. Um, and the trucks pour in the ash there every day. And after 20, 25 years, this will be new land that, you know, their company is going to be there, potentially people living there. The same thing happens in Tokyo, um, in, in Odaiba. There are a lot of places there as well. And I think that, you know, for us, it has been a big eye opener to see these places in real life. And I think you don't fully understand the issue until you see these places. And that's what we're trying to make in our film, to make these places visible for people to see what is happening. And and um, yeah. yeah, so we can Absolutely. move on from there. Well, that's that's the whole concept of doing this talk show, in fact, of of doing anything where you're trying to raise awareness. If people don't know about it, there's no way they can care about it, right? So this is so key exactly. for what you're trying to do. And this comes up again and again with people doing work, which is kind of controversial. Now, anything can be kind of controversial. Um, for example, we had a shark researcher on the series who's she's not trying to blame the fishermen for what's happening. She's just trying to raise awareness that there are better alternatives. And um, so she had some fishermen who wouldn't talk to her. 
And then she had some fishermen who would talk to her, you know, and then she focused on them and, and tried to, it's, it's the soft push in Japan, which works so well, right? To put ideas out there and to be pushing in a very soft way that's not aggressive, you know, but you're just, you're showing things. Um, so hopefully discussion and seeds will be planted and discussion will happen and awareness will happen more. Now, your images are gorgeous. Sibylla, I know you come from a photography background, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I was a photographer, mostly focusing on documentary photography for a while. And then when I came to Japan, I decided that I think documentary film is my calling. And uh, yeah. Wow. And That's last, night, for me. last yeah. night, you mentioned that uh, you're also using drones, which you can see in, in that shot above the, the landfill site. And of course, Mount Fuji as well. Um, but you mentioned you you were worried you almost lost your drones at different points. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> filming a dr with drones is just so much fun. I mean, I'm not gonna lie; like that's probably has been the best part of filming <laughs> is filming with a drone because you are seeing the world literally from an angle you know that you would never ever see and it's just really opened my eyes as a filmmaker that there is this whole other perspective out there that's so valuable and just up until recently drones weren't so accessible but now they're really cheap everyone can use them of course that comes with a whole set of issues as well with responsible use of drones but um, yeah, we had, or I rather had a, a few incidents where I almost lost a drone because the battery life is very short. And then sometimes you think you can get the drone back, but then it's very windy and the battery drains even more quickly. So I've almost lost it in the landfill site in the ocean that you were just showing. <laughs> I've almost lost it into the ocean somewhere else and almost, almost crashed it into a mountain, but I didn't, I tried to be very responsible and um, not pollute the environment even more. But, uh, you know, filming a drone, it, I think it opens up this other perspective that is so important to see. It's so important and it's the wide view, right? Like y this island that you went to, can you talk about that a little bit? It's so powerful. It's, where was it? Okay, so this is an island called Tsushima. It's between Kyushu and Korea. Um, we, the reason why we went there is because it's one of the places in Japan that has the most plastic waste washing ashore. And um, we met some amazing people there who you can also see in the picture. One is a fisherman called Kamata-san and one is a, an activist called suenaga san And they showed us one of the beaches, which by the way, is just one of many, um, where plastic waste will just collect, you know, over the years and it just keeps coming and coming and coming and they do a lot of cleanup projects in that area as well but it just it doesn't stop and they showed us this beach um it was of course super sad and impressive when we went there in person but then looking at it from the perspective of the drone where the island is so beautiful you know what i mean and then having the contrast between that the beautiful nature there's nobody there and then all of the plastic waste there is just, it's very sad, but I think it's just such a strong image that people need to see that this is happening in Japan. You know what I mean? There are a lot of places like this. And yeah, so I think the drone really opens up some new dimensions um, for us to reach people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, to go to places like this, do you need special permission from the local government or anything? Yeah, it yeah, I mean it depends on the place that you go to. We always try to make sure that we have permission to film everywhere. Um especially with the drone, sometimes you need special permission. Um in this case because nobody lives there in this area, it's um okay to film. Um but yeah, you do need permission to to film at many of the places that we have filmed at. Yeah, we've in the talk show series, we've had a few conversations with photographers who also use drones, like uh, covering the tea fields in Shizuoka or different beautiful areas. But the you've got to do paperwork, you have to register um, before each area. But it's great that you guys have a good team helping you do it properly. It's very important. Um, can you tell me about these? These guys, are they fishermen? 
So the left person is Kamata-san, who is a local fisherman who is amazing. He um, is one of the people who's really engaged is with sort of raising awareness about the plastic issue coming from the fishing community. Um, so maybe what a lot of people aren't aware of is that actually a lot of the plastic waste that does wash ashore comes from fisheries. And I think you can see it there in the background behind them, there are a lot of, you know, sort of nets and, and buoys and whatnot that they're using in the, in the fishing industry. And, and um, that's something that he talked to us about. He talks to other fisher men and, you know, fisher people in the area um, to raise awareness of this issue. He also um, was diving for us it was minus five degrees when we went there like between zero and minus five he was going into the water to film footage of underneath the water to show you know the plastic waste being there as well um it was just great to get the perspective from you know a local person who that's their job and he's trying to sort of find a way of how you know things can be continued in a more sustainable way. And then on the right side, we have Sue Nagasan, who um, is the director of a, a organization called Kappa, um, where he raises awareness for this ocean plastic issue because Tsushima is one of the places that, that has some of the most plastic waste washing ashore. Um, and they also, you know, do cleanups and just raise awareness throughout Japan that, you know, Japan is a very clean country. But that doesn't mean that there aren't issues. And I think the case of Tsushima really, unfortunately, shows this in a really powerful way that, you know, no country on earth is spared from this issue. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a comment from Okibi on YouTube. I live in the Goto Islands, very near to Tsushima and the same ocean currents. The amount of plastic washing up on the beaches here is incredible. Uh, in Hiroshima, where I am on famous Miyajima Island, it's Fushima Island, which is a holy, beautiful, amazing island where a goddess lives. Their beaches are completely covered in ocean plastics. This is not a problem only abroad. This is definitely a problem within Japan, as well as from Japan going out. Uh, you had some really powerful statistics um, in the talk last night about the contribution of plastic waste that Japan is making to the world, that some of the plastic waste is still being sent to other countries in Asia. These are things that people need to be more aware of, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's really this kind of out of sight, out of mind thing. Like we all just wanna believe that there isn't a problem, but unfortunately there is. Um, maybe Japan isn't the biggest polluter in terms of having plastic leak from within Japan, but Japan is the largest net exporter of plastic waste in the world. And what that means is if you take the number of plastic waste that gets exported minus the plastic waste that gets imported, Japan is the number one. And this is something a lot of people don't know that half, almost half of the plastic waste that's destined for recycling in Japan gets exported to other countries, especially Southeast Asia. And what happens is that we just do not know what happens to this plastic waste after it gets exported. Does it get recycled? Does it end up in the environment? If it gets recycled under what conditions? And I mean, honestly, like just the fact that countries with some of the most financial resources are the countries that are also exporting the largest amount of plastic waste. It's just unbelievable, you know? I mean, we should be able to take care of our own plastic waste before we send it to other places that have less facilities and less resources. So really, this is such an ethical issue, I feel like, that needs to be tackled, you know, as soon as Absolutely. possible. Absolutely. it's And as a responsible country like Japan, which is has a great image of efficiency and taking care of nature and and really cleaning up the streets and communities get out and sweep up all those leaves around the houses, you know, but when it comes to the beaches or the habits of using too much in the grocery stores, um, this is something that needs we need more awareness of here for sure. I love that contrast in your Kickstarter and in the in the movie where you show all the overpackaging, which we see too much of in Japan versus nature, which we want to see more of, right? The pristine nature. 
really powerful images. You guys are very talented at, at making things very clear and impactful in terms of the image, but also in terms of the information. Very well done. Thank you. I mean, I think Japan in this sense is a great example because on the surface level, it looks like everything is great. You know, everything is very clean. Um, Japan has the image of being sort of very environmentally conscious and friendly. Um, and then you do have that contrast with there is a lot of plastic waste. There is a lot of single use plastic. There is a lot of overpackaging. So I think, you know, just sort of dig deeper into what is this disconnect that is happening between the image that we have and what's happening in reality is really important for people to understand. And I think that's one of the sort of main missions probably in our film is just to show that, as I said earlier, unfortunately, no country in the world at the moment, you know, is doing an amazing job with this. We still have a really long way to go. Yeah. I visited a, a great recycling center in San Francisco called Recology, and they're at 80% diversion from landfill, which is the same as Kamikatsu, by the way, but they're catering to millions of people in San Francisco and Kamikatsu is 1500, but it doesn't matter. It's just as hard, whether it's a small population or huge, and they have curbside pickup, Kamikatsu, everybody's taking it by themselves down to the recycle center. So there's so many differences, but so many similarities as well. But even there, he was saying it's still really hard because we had this system in America, in Western countries, to send our recycling to Asian countries. And that system is kind of still in place. And he said, what I think we feel for Japan, we have to take responsibility 100% for our waste. So you had some great initiatives last night for reusing, banning plastic in different ways, uh, zero waste shops. There are a lot of great solutions and initiatives you guys are introducing. Yeah. Clem, do you want to talk a little bit more? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Like you say, I mean, like Sibi was saying, you know, it's not just about looking at the end result of where things are going wrong when it comes to our waste management. It's really about looking at the full cycle and every single part of the cycle being understood. So with the film, you know, we're just, it's a very genuine inquiry into understanding the complete cycle. We know that every single stakeholder within the cycle has a part to play. And if we can all really just increase our own awareness, up our own material literacy so that we really understand the material that is plastic and how we interact with it, and then choose different ways that work for us to start improving things. So like you say, with the reuse initiatives, with things like Loop, where we had Eric Kalabata from Loop Japan talking about the, the new reuse packaging that they're starting to bring into place, with zero waste supermarkets where you can go in and buy in bulk, with apps like MyMizu where you can be refilling your water bottle rather than uh, buying a new plastic pet bottle each time. Uh, these are small shifts that we can all make, but actually they do make a difference. And more than that, every time you make a shift like that, you start to feel more connected to the issue. And I think the greater your connection, the more you're looking for your next step. So I think for everybody, we all start really with our own personal reflection on how actually am I interacting with this material? What can I do about it? You know, that's the first step for everybody. And then you start connecting with your community. What are other people doing about it? How can we work together to do something? And of course, then you realize that actually what we have to have then is legislation and we have to start voting for change and really requesting the changes that we want to see to support you know, to support businesses as they make changes as well. You know, it's not easy for packaging companies to make a big change like that. They need really to have infrastructure in place that tells them or incentivizes green actions rather than the, the cheapest one. Definitely. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about some of the other people featured on the website and in the film? I'm bringing up some screenshots from your website here. Sure. Um, okay. So for example, one of the things that has been really important for Clementine and I is that we feature as many female voices in the industry as possible. Um, 
not just because in general female voices are underrepresented, but also in films they are, and especially what we've learned now in this whole plastic recycling, you know, environmental industry in Japan, of course, also the female voices are very much underrepresented. So um, we also had the pleasure to speak to Sanai Chiba, who's an amazing uh, scientist who um, used to work at Jamstack, um, which is a big marine science research facility in Japan. Now she's in Canada. But um, she, for example, you know, that institution has an amazing database online that has been collecting images since, I believe, the 1980s, where they send a little um, submarine that is not meant so nobody's in there down to the bottom of the ocean to take pictures and videos of plastic waste collecting all around Japan. And they literally have images dating back to the 80s where you can see plastic waste that's there most of which is still there because plastic does not just degrade like that. And that is an amazing resource, resource you know, and what they're doing with their research. They also are researching about um, garbage patches that are near Japan. I think a lot of people have heard about the great um, North Pacific garbage patch that's near the US, but there's also one apparently near Japan. And I think this research is just being done and comes out at the moment. Um, then we've talked to um, Tadashi Tokai, who is uh, used to be the vice president of Tokyo University of Marine Science. He's a professor there. Um, he was part of a study that found that the oceans around Japan contain the most microplastic out of all oceans in the entire world. And I think that's also something that probably a lot of people don't know about um, and that we will, you know, mention in our film. Um, then we have visited a lot of waste treatment facilities. We've been to a chemical recycling facilities called Jeplan. Um, we talked to um, this, the uh, founder of Jeplan there with the funny little yellow hat. <laughs> it's a company that is using um, chemical recycling methods where basically plastic is being broken down to sort of like a, an level of in towards oil and then new plastic is made from that this is sort of an emerging um, technology that's not very big yet around the world but you know a lot of people are sort of talking about it at the moment it comes with its own set of environmental issues but we want to you know just show all the different waste treatment methods that are out there and show what benefits and what potentially what sort of risks this has. And then um, another image that you have on there is from Fujimino City and Miyoshi Town Environmental Center. That's a place that actually allowed us access to an incinerator and also to um, their sorting station. And there you will just, in our film, you'll see a lot of, I think, pretty impressive imagery of the plastic waste arriving, being sorted often by hand being dumped into an incinerator. There is an incinerator right there. Um, and I think this is just really important for people to see what actually happens to our you know, everyday plastic waste. There are human beings who will sort to our plastic waste after it arrives at their facilities. There are people who take off the, the caps from pet, pet bottles after you throw them away in some cases. You know, I never thought of that. Now, when you know, I try to not use pet bottles, but when I do ha have to throw away a pet bottle, I really make sure to take off the label and the cap because we saw human beings sorting through trash, taking off the caps. And that image will never, you know, leave my mind again. So I think just seeing the things that are actually happening is, is yeah, very imp impressive, I think. Definitely. And that... That part of the plastic waste pollution problem, the social impact of the people who are involved and often underpaid, their health is the most strongly impacted in Japan as well as abroad. Where is our garbage going? How is the lives of those people impacted? I mean, you don't probably have the scope to cover that in the film, but these these are raising questions and raising awareness on a broader uh, kind of view, not just about environmentalism, not just about the environmental impact, but it has a big social impact and economic impact, right? So it really is the sustainability question 
of people, planet, and profits. How are we going to fix this? Everywhere around the world is having a similar issue. Do we have innovation? Do we have ideas for leveling up so Japan can get there and start choosing better so the economy is more stable? Because this is impacting all of us around the world. And Japan is so great with innovation. So let's get there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, I do feel like in Japan now, this movement is really, you know, gaining momentum. And I do feel like there's more awareness now. I really hope this will continue over the next few years because this is an issue that needs to be addressed now and not in 10 years. Definitely. I, I have a feeling, and I've heard this from people abroad during coronavirus, people have become more aware of the environmental impact. Right now in the US, we're having the worst heat wave ever in places that usually don't have heat waves. It's getting worse. The worst on record is happening all the time over and over again, right? So the plastic is a big part of all of our global concerns. And it's not only environmental equity or quality of the environment, it's also human equity and quality of life. So I'm, I'm so excited for this film and I'm so happy that you guys are investing so much time, effort, and a lot of money in this huge project. I mean, like you were talking about before, Sybil, it's, you're doing so much research as well as the interviews, as well as the, the filming. How do you find time for all of this? You only started in 2019, it's amazing. Yeah, I think the only way to do it is to be really passionate about the topic because, you know, the plastic waste issue is so complex and Clementine and I went into this project thinking that we were going to make a film about bioplastic. That was the original name of our film. And oh, have we been wrong because I think about a year of research has taught us that the solution to plastic is not to replace it with a different um, material, but the solution is that we have a giant issue with the way our entire system of production, delivery, consumption, end of life is working in a very linear way where we just take resources, um, spend a lot of energy, um, you know, making them into products that are being used sometimes for a few seconds and then thrown away rather than having a circular system. And that's the term of circular economy that's always been thrown around. Um, where we take only a few materials and then, you know, have them in the circle over and over and over again, where they don't end up being waste in the, wasted in the first place. Um, so, yeah, I think for us, it's just been, we we're very passionate about this topic. The more we researched into it, the more we realized how many hidden issues there are. And I think this just sort of gave us more motivation to keep going and to show these issues in our film. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> the reason why it's been taking us so long is because it's been very complex and and we are doing this sort of as a passion project at this on side of what we're doing otherwise. Um, but, uh, you know, I feel like this mission is more important than this is greater than us, you know, this is something that for our entire society, that's amazing. I think that's the motivation that keeps us going. Yeah, Clementine, you were talking about uh, during coronavirus and and it, you know, trying to shift what you could do um, during the pandemic. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so we, like Sibby says, we started uh, before coronavirus hit and we were due to start filming in the spring of 2020. And of course, that all just got put on pause. But that huge advantage really and I think for everybody that we had last year is that through pausing and through having to stop, actually we got to really stop and reflect on what we were really trying to do with it. And we got to go a lot deeper with our research. So we had a much longer stretch of research, a longer period to form our team, a longer period to connect with the people that we wanted to film with. And so when we did eventually start filming very carefully in October with a lot of uh, Corona measures in place, we were in a much better place to start. And I think the film has been far deeper as a result. I mean, our, our big takeaways really have been that the, you know, the, the issue is so complex 
that you cannot assume anything. You know, every time we've gone into any issue, making any assumption, we've almost always been proved wrong. And there is no simple solution. It's about finding a lot of different solutions that contribute to systemic change. Definitely. Well, the scope is is worldwide. <laughs> the scope is, you know, like I've I've been researching sustainability for almost 20 years now in Japan, and I'm still discovering new things. So, mm -hmm. you know, for you guys to have started in 2019, going and doing these interviews and researching as much as you can, it you know, I mean, things are developing much faster now, which is great. And you have such great partners, but this is daunting, you know. Um, what is your what is your scope? What is your timeline from now? Because you're trying to finish by next year, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, we want to try to finish as soon as possible to get it to everybody um, who's waiting to see the film. Um, we are planning to film for a few more months. It all depends on how the pandemic is also. Um, you know, progressing. We've been, our shoots have been put on hold many times because of it. But um, yeah, so we're hoping to be able to finish the film by the end of this year. And then um, we will submit it to a lot of film festivals in Japan and abroad to, you know, get it out there to a wide audience. And then after that, we are planning to do as many screenings as we can, both in Japan and abroad, also screenings at schools and universities. I think with this film, we really just want as many people as possible to see it. And especially in Japan, we want as many people as possible um, to see it. So yeah, it's coming in 2022, I think. Wow. Do we know a month yet or is still to be decided? It's still to be decided because <laughs> in the film world, unfortunately, <laughs> Um, there's always this issue with film premieres and you have to wait until it's premiered somewhere before you can officially show it. So it all depends on um, how well our film is doing at film festivals. And then we will announce everything as soon as we know. Now, you mentioned film festivals. Are you getting any funding from organizations as well? Uh, yes, we are getting funding. Um, so, for example, where I'm from Austria, um, we're, we've been lucky in the sense that there are some film funds we could apply for from local governments um, that are set up for independent filmmakers. Without those, we would have not been able to make this film. Um, and then we got a small grant also from our university um, that has, you know, those grants have enabled us to sort of get the film to this point where we are now. And now <laughs> that we're running out of funds, it's the perfect time for us to throw the crowdfunder on Kickstarter, um, through which we hope then to just finish, you know, funding whatever is still necessary to make the film. So the rest of our shoots that we still need to do, we still have our whole post-production. We want to create an amazing soundtrack that will really draw people in also on, you know, the sound level. Um, and we want to just, you know, get the film out there to as many places as possible, which of course also requires some funds. So, um, yeah, hopefully the Kickstarter will help us kickstart a bigger, <laughs> um, movement in Japan and abroad with this film. Yeah. So besides the Kickstarter, what are some other ways that people might be able to help you guys? Like sharing the <sighs> yeah, website that's... and... Yeah, Clem, I think uh, you always have some good suggestions for people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been really lovely. Really, since last night, people have been sharing images from the film, links to the Kickstarter, links to our website, links to our social media. We're at Plastic Love Film. And you can see we're up, obviously updating and sharing images. And really, that is the main thing, is just getting the message out there, getting in touch with us as well. We're loving hearing from people who care about the issues. So just feel free to reach out to us feel free to connect with us on social media and of course if you know somebody who is also feeling frustrated about the issue just send send it their way we would love just to be growing our plastic conscious community throughout plastic free july 
Yeah. And if you're from a community where, you know, you're at a school or a university or a local community or a company or an institution where you feel like you want to show the film at some point next year, please also reach out to us. We don't know, of course, yet when we can show the film, but, you know, we want to com connect with as many people as possible and make the movie available to as many people as possible, especially for educational purposes. So um, please reach out to us. Wonderful. And uh, Clem, you're in the production zone. Have you reached out to any networks like Netflix or any big sponsors that might help you out a little bit? Yeah. They just they just hosted Seaspiracy, right? And uh, some other very environmental focused films. Yeah, Netflix has been doing a great job of sharing some really interesting documentaries. Of course, when we were doing our research, we've watched a huge amount of them over the last couple of years. And of course, we would be hoping to get onto a large platform like that, again, just to really reach the largest audience we possibly can. Yeah, well, that'd be wonderful. So you have this Kickstarter going, you have a website going, you have a Facebook page, um, Instagram as well, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and, yeah, you can reach us on all like large social media through at Plastic Love Film. We have a website, it's plasticlovefilm.com. And our Kickstarter, if you type in Plastic Love Documentary Film, you should also be able to find us. Great. And I love the idea that you are also collaborating with people doing cleanups because I find that when you do cleanups, it's the best way to raise awareness mm -hmm. because you pick up things that you're like, I bought that before, like it connects to your consumer experience personally. And the next time you go out, you're going to choose something maybe in a reusable container or biodegradable container if you can. So I think that is a great way to spread the message about the film as well as doing the cleanup and raising awareness about plastic. Um, if anybody out there has any other great uh, tie ups or collaborations in mind, uh, please make sure to reach out to Clementine and Sibyl, Sibylla, um, definitely. Any other ideas in the works? Any other events after people get vaccinated, maybe? You heading back yeah, to Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> 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 we want to. We're hoping to do screenings in Kamikaze when we're done with the film. Oh, I mean, perfect. as part of our campaign, we are we are planning to do a beach cleanup. I think you, you already mentioned it, but towards the end of the month, we will do a beach cleanup probably somewhere in a beach near Tokyo around Kanagawa Prefecture. So anybody who wants to join us, please, uh, please do. We will announce everything on social media. Um, everyone is welcome to join and we're so happy to meet people in a safe way and post corona obviously we want to you know be involved in as many events as possible and meet as many of you as we can that's great and uh like we have okibi here saying that uh they're doing cleanups where they are in the goto islands uh we're doing cleanups here in hiroshima maybe whenever we do cleanups you guys can retweet ours and we'll retweet yours and we'll all collaborate on social media that way as well and share the message from our own groups yeah yes please let's do i mean let's support each other and and we're all fighting for the same goal so it's great to see all the movements around the country absolutely it takes a village right it takes a, a big effort to make make real changes but I really appreciate what you guys are doing. I think it's fantastic and powerful, horrible and inspiring. Uh, all those, all those feelings come when I watch that preview and I can't wait to see more. So best of luck for the next few months as you guys really get things done and uh, try to get more collaborators and raise some funds on Kickstarter. So your immediate goal and then you have a stretch goal. Can you just mention that, Clementine? Yes, that's right. So we've got our immediate goal, which is to really just make sure we can get the film finished. I mean, whatever happens, we're getting the film finished. You know, Sibylla and I have been so committed to it. There's no way that the film is not getting finished, but how we finish it and how many people we can reach is really what the Kickstarter is all about. So we've got our immediate goal, which you can see where, oh, it's quite exciting how things are moving towards already since last night. Thank you so much, everybody who's already supported us. That's so exciting. Um, and if we can hit that, then really we can start 
just making sure that we can get it out to film festivals, making sure we can get some outreach, making sure we can get our soundtrack moving forward. Then if we reach our stretch goal, then we've really got the potential to do a few more things that we would love to do as part of the film, really making sure that we have powerful graphics so that we can share the statistics about the Jap Japan very clearly and people can really see our message. And what we would love to do if we had the opportunity is go to one of the countries where Japan is exporting plastic waste. For example, Indonesia is one of the uh, highest um, to receive our waste and actually see it there because we feel like it would be very powerful to see Japanese plastic waste in landfill in Indonesia. Yeah. Wow, powerful. So important to have transparency on these issues and to show what's actually what's the actual case. It's not spin, it's not greenwashing. This is what's happening. And that's the power of documentary filmmaking. So really great job. And thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you so much, Clementine and Sibylla. Thank you so much for joining and sharing your insights on this great project. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much for having us. It's such a pleasure to connect with everyone. And thank you everyone for listening and supporting us. Yeah, and thank you so much. It's been really lovely to be here. And thank you, Joy, for all you're doing with Seeking Sustainability Podcast, bringing people together like this. It's awesome. Great. It's so great to connect with you guys here. And I'm sure we will be collaborating more as the months go ahead, as we share the exciting cleanups and other events that you're doing to promote the film and raise some funds. So keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank Take you. care.